And joining us now in the studio, Mark Kingwell, author of Concrete Reveries, Consciousness and the City. Hello again. Hi. Yesterday, uh, we looked at the relationship between architecture and politics. And today, I want to look at sort of the other part of your book, which is looking at the relationship between consciousness and the city. So let's, we talked a little bit yesterday about New York. So let's start with New York again. Um, how is New York, and many cities are organized following its lead. How, how is it organized? Well, the most significant thing is, is the Manhattan grid and uh, you find chunks of grid elsewhere. But given that Manhattan is the borough that is at the center of the, the whole city, uh, it's the focus of financial and cultural life, the grid is significant. The, uh, Manhattan's grid is itself uh, a, a really fascinating historical achievement. It's part of the, it was laid out as part of the 1811 commissioner's plan in the US, which uh, suggested really that a kind of uh, a rectilinear plan could be applied to the entire geographical space of, of the United States. And so out west, you've got straight lines for borders on states and dividing up counties and so on. Uh, and in the city, you got the street plan, the grid. Uh, what the grid did in Manhattan was not just divide up the space, but divide up the financial opportunities. So the, the grid is laid over big parts of Manhattan, not all of it. Uh, I can maybe say something about that in a second. Uh, but in order to create the blocks that are familiar and then deploy them as parcels of land for maximization of profit. Uh, so the grid isn't everywhere in Manhattan. Well, yeah, that's the interesting thing. So if you go to Midtown, of course, that's where the grid rules. But Manhattan is an island. It has a topography. So if you go to the edges of the island, especially down in the south end of the island, uh, the grid goes all crazy. So I used to live on West 4th Street in New York, and West 4th Street is, is unlike most of the east-west numbered streets, um, starts angling up and down at different moments without warning. Uh, and right around there in the West Village, uh, there are all kinds of streets that are you know, jumbled with respect to the grid. It's actually possible to get lost over there, which uh, might seem crazy when you think of... New York. Well, yeah, <laughs> Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street or something like that. Uh, so the historical legacy of the fact that Manhattan was developed from the, the south of the island up is preserved in these, these kind of non-gridded parts, especially even more so downtown in the financial district. So uh, this is really great to, to make sure that you see that part of, of how the grid is uh, refused by the physical reality of the island. And its attempt to control and deploy everything is only limited in its success. And you argue that the grid sort of provides this uh, liberating duality, or as uh, Rem Koolhaas, the mm -hmm. architect, said, uh, a metropolis of rigid chaos. How so? Well, it, it, it does a whole bunch of things. Uh, the, the financial thing I just mentioned, first of all, in the limited space that those streets create, uh, offers the first modern urban imperative of density, true density, and specifically vertical density. So. It's, that's why the, the skyscraper is born in New York. It's because there isn't enough land to go around at grade, so you create, as it were, more land by going up stories and stories and stories. And uh, the most significant development there, of course, is the, uh, the Otis elevator, because without elevators, you can't build beyond six stories or five. Uh, I used to date someone who lived in a, in a six-floor walk-up in the West Village, and uh, you know, I, was losing all kinds of weight, just climbing those <laughs> stairs all the time. Uh, you, you can't climb more than six stories. So once the elevator's in place, really the sky's the limit. And uh, now you've got collisions. You've got rigidity because, yeah, you've got four square blocks. Uh, and, and you can be localized anywhere on the grid. You know, if you, you give an intersection, that pinpoints your location. And within that rigidity, uh, actually, all kinds of possibilities is uh, offered, right? So you, uh, it is an interesting play, as you find in art forms, between constraint and creativity. Uh, if you have no constraints, if there are no rules or limits, then creativity doesn't, as it were, have enough pressure on it to, to you know, shoot somewhere. Uh, the right kind of constraint gives you all kinds of creative opportunities. And uh, so that's what, what Coolhouse means about Manhattan, he, and he goes on about the Manhattanization or the Manhattan effect. Uh, I love this idea that, that uh, under conditions of what look like rigid uh, spatial uh, control, you can go anywhere, you can do anything. And that's, you know, that's ever been the promise of New York. It's the place where you can do anything. And then how do, how do the suburbs sort of invert this relationship? Well, the, the North American suburbs, not so much in, in New York, but in, in other cities, uh, become dominated more by the car than by the, by the pedestrian. So, uh, and we all know this, that uh, once you surrender the field to the car, 
the car is kind of alien presence in, in a place like Manhattan. Uh, there is lots of traffic, but uh, you know, really, it's a walker's mm -hmm. space. Once you surrender to the car, then your street plan follows the car. So you don't want a lot of intersections. You want a lot of flow. And <clears throat> hence, the, the, among other reasons, hence the sort of can of worms suburban development plans where you get long streets that are lined with houses and there might be a four-way stop sign you know, every quarter mile or something like that because you want to get into the suburb, get through, get to your car garaged and get into the backyard and light the barbecue. You don't want to talk to your neighbors. You don't want to have to deal with anybody at intersections. So the completely inverted urban space, suburban, exurban space, but a space of living. And this happened almost without people noticing it. Mm. Uh, some of the early planned um, suburban developments or near suburban developments like Levittown or even North York in, in Toronto uh, were, were much more sensitive to the fact that people might need to walk uh, to get groceries or to go to the subway. Once you get into the big sort of exurban suburban developments, forget about walking anywhere. Some places don't even have sidewalks. You know, why have sidewalks when people don't walk anywhere? And if you, if you do walk along, you're considered a freak. Hmm. You know, there's something weird about even walking. You certainly wouldn't carry groceries anywhere. You, you get in your car. You go to the, the big box store. You get your groceries. You it go. is interesting. I mean, you almost um, subconsciously notice someone walking in an environment where people don't walk. It, it catches your eye all the time. It's like, oh, that's a guy walking. Where <laughs> is when you're in a downtown of a city, you would never say, hey, there's a guy walking. I was, I was in Alexandria, Virginia once. This is uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. It's near Dulles Airport. And uh, I was staying at this horrible sort of motel uh, to give a talk. And uh, there, was, there was no room service and no restaurant. So I thought, well, what do I do? I started walking along the side of this, this, you know, the verge. There's no sidewalk. The verge of this four-lane suburban road to the 7-Eleven. And people were honking and hooting at me. Uh, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a great experience. Sort of, wow, look at the freak walking. <laughs> and I was like, I'd just go to the 7-Eleven to get some Doritos, you know? Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it, you become the alien presence. The car is, is, is king, and you are the alien. I'm going to get back to the New York grid. Um, how does it sort of represent the thesis of modernity? Well, the, co the conjunction that I highlight in the book is something that I don't think has received uh, enough attention, which is that <laughs> the grid itself, the very idea of the XYZ axis, and especially the aerial view, the X, XY, uh, comes out of Cartesian geometry. And we also know Descartes, so that, that's maybe Descartes' most influential uh, creative idea, that you can abstract space into straight lines and locations within the, the abstract space created by those straight lines. Uh, immensely powerful. You can't, you can't do modern physics without it. You can't do mechanics. You can't do, obviously, geometry, but you also can't plot all kinds of relationships. You know, think about how many XY graphs you see in a given day conveying information about the economy or population growth or whatever. So it's a hugely powerful thing. This, but Descartes is also known for creating what we call the mind-body problem or highlighting the mind-body problem and having a theory of consciousness which, while, while incorrect uh, and, and sort of devilishly uh, influential, um, goes along as, as something that we have to grapple with. And you know that idea is that that the mind is one kind of substance, the body is another kind of substance altogether, and somehow we're conjunctions of the two. So Descartes, you know, we call him the first modern philosopher, but he's the first modern urban planner too, mm. in in my terms, because he has these two ideas that that flow through each other. And when we're on grids in the city, uh, we are for, uh, forming our consciousness, uh, having it formed, and. Uh, we are, as it were, the, the children of Descartes, whether we like it or not. Uh, this, this, to me, I think, is underappreciated. You said he got it wrong, but remind us how Descartes viewed consciousness. Well, so if the, if the mind is a separate substance from the body, not only separate, but a different kind of substance, uh, the, one of the basic, well, there are two really urgent problems. One is, how is it possible that they relate? So I'm waving my hand, um, and I'm, I'm, as it were, you know, deciding to do that. How is it that I have mental activity, like an intention to wave my hand, that results in this physical activity? Uh, Descartes kicks the problem upstairs. He says that <laughs> the mind and the body are joined deep inside the brain in the pineal gland, as if that explained it. <laughs> so that's one problem. Uh, the other problem that, that he creates is a kind of inadvertent solipsism, so that I know my own consciousness, I'm experiencing it right now, but how can I know that you are conscious? Uh, 
you know, you seem to be. Uh, you keep asking me these questions, and you, yeah, I mean, you, if I had to try to prove to you right now that I was conscious, could I not do that? Well, you couldn't on Descartes' terms because nothing that you said or did is anywhere except within my own consciousness, for, as far as I'm experiencing it. So you can you can keep yelling I'm conscious as much as you want, <laughs> and I've still got the problem. This is what we call the problem of other minds. So th these are these are philosophical problems with his view, but the view nevertheless is is persistent and influential. We often think of ourselves precisely in Carti Cartesian terms. You know, when I feel like my body betrays me, or uh, it lets me down, or uh, I wish I could do something but I physically can't. Uh, so we. We know there's a problem here. Phenomenology is, is one of the schools of thought that says, let's go back to basics on consciousness and try to understand how it is a kind of embodied experience. That consciousness is not separate from the body. Consciousness, as it were, is the body in place. And th then you start you know, resisting the kind of interiority that's typical of the Cartesian picture, where it's like, I'm, I'm inside my mind. But no, your consciousness is everything that you experience, everything that you do. And one important way to do that is to do a phenomenology of place, of, of your uh, lived experience of being in place, of having the in front and the behind, the left and the right, the up and the down. Someone's across from you talking. Things are around you. Uh, or those watching, you're in a room with something in front of you, a screen. And we're always in place. Mm. And this shows us that however powerful Descartes' abstraction of space, of X, Y, Z spaces, more primordial is the experience of place. That you experience yourself as occupying a place more basically and more profoundly than you do uh, experiencing a space. Uh, you need to abstract from place in order to manipulate space, if you like, uh, but, but space, as it were, comes first in terms of your experience. So this uh, mind-body sort of distinction separates man, woman, from nature? Well, that's one of the negative consequences of it. If you uh, think of yourself as, um, first of all, a distinct sort of entity than all the other unminded things out there. Descartes thought dogs and cats and horses didn't have minds, and really they were just the same as mechanical toys. Mm. So he, this was his argument in favor of vivisection, for example, and, and there are some probably false stories of him kicking dogs because well, why not? I mean, they. They have behavior, but they don't have consciousness. This allows humans to, to indulge their exceptionalism. So we see ourselves as distinct entities from everything else in the world, everything that's not conscious. This is a bad thing on the whole, because the more exceptional we think ourselves, the more likely we are to um, see ourselves as, as in a position of control and dominance over the rest of the world. Not just cats and dogs and horses, but the natural environment and um, resources. And so that as you know, we think that we are sort of um, on top and everything else is below us, whereas it's probably better to think of ourselves as just one aspect of the natural world. Right? Everything is the natural world. We're, everything, even the things we build, are built in the natural world by creatures like us who are natural world creatures. And you can see this more developmentally then, as it, rather than as a, as a uh, project of, of dominance and control. Arguably. Um this would lead us to misuse or master the environment, misuse the environment then? Well, the very idea that you could master it is already two steps along to misuse, I, I think. Hmm. Because uh, there's, there's um, a lot of, of argument to be had about this, but uh, first of all, we do a bad job at this so-called mastery project. You know, we, we achieve all kinds of things. We can build amazing things. We can create incredible systems, but we do damage all along the way. We pollute behind us. Uh, we, we create great materials uh, and we extract energy from, from the ground, uh, but we leave you know, a kind of wake of destruction. So it's, a, it's not working. Even if it were working, it's probably not a good idea because uh, it continues to allow us uh, this false view of um, consumption, of our consumption, rather than one of stewardship or uh, natural sustainable existence. And uh, you know, to get back to cities, uh, most of the mistakes that have been made in um, urban planning have been the result of thinking that it's a, it's a part of a mastery project. Hmm. Right? So I've got a chunk of land. How am I going to develop it? You know, develop usually means not develop it in a sustainable and, and you know, productive way, 
maybe recently some people, but how am I going to maximize the profit that I can extract from it? And as I say, this has made incredible things. This, the skyscraper would not exist if this were not part of the, the, the way of thinking. But we're coming to the point now where we can no longer go on this way, and we have ways of thinking and of building that don't have to be part of this mastery model, uh, and we need to explore those. Have we superseded the city? Superseded it's in gone past time. it. We always hear that the cities don't work for us anymore. That you're talking about development and building, and I'm just, are we post city? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, it, the city is, I like to say, the city is, is the most complex machine that, that humans have ever created. Uh, because it is, it is a, a, a machine, but it's also an organism. And uh, it's probably the only future that we can have on this planet. Uh, not the way we're currently building cities, um, by and large, but if we're, if we're not going to control for population, which we don't want to do, uh, we have to have places, dense places on Earth where people can gather. Uh, and there are lots of other great reasons to have cities. They're, they're the, the uh, site of what economists call positive externalities, you know, the places where um, unexpected good things happen, things that you didn't bargain for. Of course, lots of negative externalities too, like noise and pollution. This balance is part of what attracts us to the city. The city for centuries has been the place people want to go. Uh, so I don't think that's going to change. Mm. Uh, but we, we need to build cities in, in more uh, conscious ways. And part of my focus on consciousness was not just what's the consciousness of being in a specific place, walking around, <clears throat> but how can you be more conscious about your own experience of your city and, and its future? I want to uh, bring up a picture. This is of a, a suburban shopping mall. I actually don't know where the suburban shopping mall is, is, but it doesn't really matter because it's such a common sight in any suburban city. Uh, you know, it could come from, well, you know, great, anywhere in the greater <coughs> Toronto area. You could probably find that Ajax or Mississauga or Newmark and just, you know, many, many more. Um, and I'm wondering, does this sort of sameness uh, create a unity, uh, like some common ground uh, uh, f for members of the community? Well, it's interesting, that image you can see the influence of, uh, maybe slightly cynical influence of, of good urban planning there, create a sort of tiny little suggestion of a village street, right? Uh, but of course, it's all the same brands that you see everywhere else. And it, you could have seen a much more heinous version of the big box stores in, I, my favorite bad version of this is the whole strip south of Edmonton, uh, as, you, as you drive the long, long way to the airport from downtown Edmonton. Uh, downtown Edmonton is actually kind of cool, but you, you go through this, this really <laughs> extended kind of um, blasted earth of, of big box stores with people driving in and getting their stuff. Uh, the, the argument in favor of this, of course, is that it's efficient. And, uh, and that is true. I mean, you, you, uh, you minimize retail um, footprint by having it all in one place and everybody has to come to it. And the same brands make people feel happy because and comfortable. right they're familiar, and uh, so I know what I'm going to get. You know, it's uh, uh, it always reminds me of when I first went to Amsterdam with some American friends, and I I'd heard about Reichstafel, which is you know the Indonesian uh, smorgasbord. And I said we got to we got to try that, and they were like, no, um, we'll just go to McDonald's <laughs> because we know what we're going to get. Uh, there's 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 not much to to argue against those things, except that. We know that the costs on the other side are actually quite high. So uh, think of Detroit as a different example of um, what happens to a downtown when not only the people, but all the retail moves to the suburbs. Downtown Detroit was for many years a, a complete wasteland, a disaster. There's been some recent moves to uh, redevelop its waterfront, um, the, lay of the riverfront. Uh, but there's a, there's a passage I always remember in a Richard Ford novel where the protagonist is staying at a downtown Detroit hotel and he goes out to a bar and the, the description of walking back to the hotel is just one of the bleakest couple of paragraphs in American <laughs> fiction about what happens to you know the, the urban flight. Uh, so downtowns are great. We should make sure that any, anything that happens in the suburbs doesn't have cost downtown because uh, this is the, the path to um, the, the complete dominance of the car. And I didn't mention, but it's obvious, that the car needs fossil fuel. Uh, humans walking or biking around don't need fossil fuel. And that's this so crashingly obvious, I don't even have to say it, but I'm just going to say it. Um, fossil fuels are a bad thing. <laughs> We're running out of them, and 
uh, the kinds of renewable energy that we have, like food for our bodies, uh, is much, much more sustainable. So let's build with that fact in mind. Let's pick on the suburbs a little bit more. Um, <laughs> only to say, you know, this idea of the sameness, like I said, you could find that suburban shopping mall just about anyway. How does that sameness turn places it into what Cool House referred to as this idea of junk spaces? Junk spaces, yeah. Well, the, um, the basic idea is that you, you can find junk spaces anywhere, not just in the suburbs. And what he meant by it are, is anything that is undesigned. Uh, and you might think, well, here's a building. Surely it was designed. In one sense, yes. But in many other senses, no. So uh, I mean, think of the, the, the uh, Toronto waterfront, which is a very interesting contested space. Tons of residential uh, footage, square footage going up in the air. Most of those buildings, 99% of those buildings, are architecturally undistinguished. So in that, in that important sense, they weren't designed. <clears throat> More significantly, it's not clear that they were designed for the, the, the city itself, uh, with the city itself in mind. Uh, the, the mode of force are developers, uh, money from East Asia and South Asia, uh, and from other parts of Canada, uh, creating sort of muscling into the air these residential spaces. The one good thing you can say about that, and, and this is what I think will keep it from being a total junk space, is that there's infill at base. And um, if, it, if that part of Toronto sort of nestles further up against their genuine downtown, and you know, the projected aquarium, for example, will do this, bring the aquarium and the Sky Dome, Sky Dome, I don't call it the Rogers Centre, into contact, then we might actually have a good density down there. But the, the aesthetically, it's, it's just a, a disaster. But it, it does this idea of junk, spa junk space, uh, how do I put it, sort of make a, a loss of place? Well, yeah, that the, um, to go back to really the, the keynote of, of our discussion today, um, the experience of place is so basic to human consciousness that it really has defined the contours of our identity for centuries. And, and if, if, if somebody hears that and thinks, wait a second, what? I just invite them to think about the different places that they occupy in a given day, you know, the bedroom, the kitchen, uh, the sidewalk. Uh, so the places, uh, if you create indistinguishable shopping and residential spaces, you might actually you know, create them almost as placeless. Uh, and, and then this placelessness then would be a kind of identity crisis. Uh, and you could even argue this is, this is the, uh, the downside of, of <clears throat> post-modernity, that, that you would be in a, not in a, a kind of crisis of narrative, but in a crisis of identity. Uh, you wouldn't be anyone in particular because you wouldn't be anywhere in particular. Hmm. Uh, that's a kind of nightmare vision, and uh, there are all kinds of things that countervail. But yeah, I, I do think that the, these, these little cubicles up in the air with the same retail as anywhere else on the planet, it's almost like living in an airport lounge, you know? That's the first place where you notice, I, it's the first place I noticed, um, especially the retail version of placelessness. You know, are you in... Narita, are you in Schiphol? Are you in Charles de Gaulle? Well, a lot of ways you can't even tell if it's the tie rack and, and the, you know, the body shop and whatever. Uh, I think airports lately have tried to individuate themselves a little more so that, that you get a kind of experience that is full of place. But uh, that's the sort of classic of the placeless place. Duty free is kind of, it sells the same thing anywhere you are in the world. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Okay, beyond the airport, what's the solution to this you know, postmodern condition? In architectural terms, I, I think the, the, um, the kinds of, of solutions are clear. Uh, resisting the, the urge to design without the, the person and the experience of place in mind. Uh, that's hard because architects work for clients. And if the client is a developer who wants cheap, fast, and easy, it's very hard to resist that. And so that gets into a more systemic problem, which is not a problem of architecture. It's a problem of capitalism. Uh, and, and that is that uh, we are democratizing space. We're, we're still doing, at the beginning of the 21st century, what uh, Le Corbusier was trying to do at the beginning of the 20th. But we're doing it now uh, in a kind of runaway train fashion. And the, the profit margins are so big for some people that it's very hard to push back on that. Uh, the only kinds of solutions that, that naturally come to mind there are regulation, building codes, and, and city plans, aggressive city plans. Uh, 
we've seen this in the past. You know, Toronto had a really great city plan for a long time. Large chunks of it just abandoned without any political opposition. Uh, University Avenue was going to be the Champs Elysees of Toronto. Uh, the railway lands, which are now being developed into these condo towers and high rises, uh, were supposed to be mixed use. There was there was actually a lien on that land that some of it had to be public housing or low income housing. That got thrown out the window. So these are kinds of things that it's political will is necessary to make those things happen. It's not just a, a matter of regulation. You actually have to have people who care about the city as a whole and push back on the forces of money. Let me end on this. I want to ask you if you were to address a, a room full of you know, new graduates, uh, architecture students, what kind of advice would you give them? Uh, <laughs> design from the inside out, not from the outside in. Uh, there has been all too much emphasis on the silhouette and the, the striking signature building, the building that people take pictures of from the sidewalk. Uh, the Royal Ontario Museum, Liebeskind Renault, is, is my, you know, that's a, that's a building that was designed from the outside in. The interior spaces were left to fend for themselves and, and with predictable results. If you design from the inside out, that means not only do you put the people first, you put place first and let the silhouette look after itself. Mark Hugh, well, this is fascinating. It surely made me think of the city in a very different way. So thank you very much for coming in Great. and talking about thank it. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.